Hi everyone, welcome back. This video is going to be something a little bit different, not your standard gameplay video. Today I'm going to go into why, in depth, I think that Days is an important card for Legacy. In recent weeks, it has become clear that Blue Red Tempo is the dominant strategy, and talks on how to remedy this, banned talks, have coalesced into two main ideas. The first is that Tempo got a lot of strong upgrades recently as a result of the fire design philosophy that WotC is designing their cards under. These upgrades are beyond the power level of what is acceptable in Legacy, and so one or more of them should be banned. The other main narrative is that while these cards are pushed, the Tempo archetype has been in the spot numerous times, it's always good, Delver's always too good, and therefore we can't just ban the fire cards, we have to hit something from the shell. So we have to ban a card like Days in order to avoid running into this problem into the future. This video is going to be an in-depth explanation of why I think that Days is good for Legacy. I feel that Twitter is not the best place for you know, such a long in-depth uh, thought process, and so I wanted to make a video and explain it better. I'm only going to be covering Days as it exists in Tempo, because this is the only shell that is currently causing issues in the meta slash spurring ban talk. This video is going to be two main parts. The first one is going to go over the benefits of Days and Legacy and why it's desirable to keep it. The second part is going to address common arguments that I've heard for Days' banning and hopefully rebut them in a way that you find convincing. Before I jump into these, I want to quickly level set both what I view the goal slash sweet spot to be for the tempo archetype, along with what I believe should be included in the next BNR. I reference both of these things throughout the video. Bands generally have a goal in mind. The goal is to put a deck into a certain place, a certain level within the metagame, you know, power wise. I think that Legacy is in a good spot when the tempo strategies are good slash viable, but not tier zero slash must play. A ban is good if it achieves this outcome. If I were Watsi, I would ban Ragavan, Expressive Iteration, and Murktide Regent. There are other in-depth pieces of content detailing why these cards are too strong for Legacy. I won't be doing a deep dive here because it would be too derailing, but the short is that the creatures are too above rate and Expressive Iteration gives the Tempo Shell strong card advantage, which has historically been problematic. Without further ado, let's dive into why Days is good for Legacy. While I do occasionally play Delver, you know, I do occasionally sleeve up the tempo strategy, I tend to be on the other side of the table to it more often than not. In my time playing Legacy, I have found playing against the card Days to be satisfying because it rewards skill and proper sequencing. In Magic generally, and certainly in a high power format such as Legacy, making the strongest play for your turn is extremely correlated with spending all of your mana. There's so many good things to do. Against Days, this creates an interesting subgame. You have to make a risk reward assessment about making your strongest play for the turn and risking it getting dazed, or making a weaker play that's more likely to resolve and leave the opponent unable to convert a card in their hand. This is sometimes known as virtual card advantage or a forced mulligan. Let's take a step back. This assessment, this is skill. This is a spot where two players, even very good ones, could reasonably disagree on the right play depending on the details. So much goes into this evaluation, including but not limited to how much better is my best play than my second best play? How ahead slash behind am I if my second best play results? How good is it for me if the opponent has to return a land to their hand? How likely are they to even have the days given previous game actions? How heavy is my hand? Which is just another way of saying, you know, what's the CMC of my cards? Do I have expensive cards? Do I have cheap cards? Can I double spell so that I use all my mana without losing a high impact spell to a daze? Am I likely to be able to blank a daze for the entire game? 
Now this last point is something I feel newer players too often overlook. I have watched countless games where a player gives their day's opponent a free wasteland starting on turn zero. They decided I'm never going to play into days. I'm going to play around the days for the entire game. So starting on turn one, they don't use one mana. Starting on turn two, they only use one mana. On turn three, they only use two mana. And as this happens, they fall further and further behind to the point where they can no longer play around days and they get a card dazed on turn five or six. They have to play it or they're going to lose because they've not spent their mana efficiently. And then on turn five or six, they get dazed. It can be easy to walk away from a game like this and feel that dazed was very strong. But many of these games could have been won if the player just took the one for one trade on the first few turns, allowing them to use their mana efficiently while forcing the opponent to return a land to their hand. Contrary to popular belief, the turn one daze isn't free. It actually costs about three mana because you don't get two mana on turn two, you don't get three mana on turn three, you know, etc. All of this makes playing against daze very rewarding in a way that playing against fire design isn't. The level of nuance and decision making and agency that you have to choose to play around or into this card simply doesn't exist with fire designs. Days kind of feels like you're fencing, you know, it's a very strategic, very positional type of, you know, sport where fire design just feels like two players swinging sledgehammers at each other. Not everyone agrees with my rosy depiction of the days sub game. And this is because, to their credit, there are times when the days sub game either can't be played or the days player is too obviously advantaged. Some examples would be when it's too disadvantageous to let a threat stay on the board. Uh, and a good example of this would be Ragavan, where compared to other threats, the giving the Delver opponent three mana on their turn two and the, you know, 20 to 30 percent chance of them drawing a card depending on the construction of your deck, this is simply too much of a cost to incur to play around days, and so you can't play the subgame. Another example is when there's little or no disadvantage of returning a land to your hand, even on turn one. Uh, a good example of this would, um, again, be Ragavan, where if you daze on turn one, this is normally a big cost, but because you are generating the treasure, uh, it basically negates the cost, and so there's very much uh, not a downside for the Delver player to just daze any one mana spell that's put on the stack that threatens the Ragavan. Another example is when the Days player has strong card advantage, such that they don't mind indiscriminate one-for-one -one trades, such as with expressive iteration. The idea of trading one-for-one -one with Days early is that you, the opponent, should have a stronger late game because your opponent is playing an aggressive tempo deck. So the one-for-one -one trades kind of settle out, and then later on you pull ahead because your deck is stronger. This is less true when the Delver player has strong card advantage. Another example is when the Days player has access to threats that are too efficient at ending the game after the early game has traded out. Uh, and a good example of this would be, of course, Merc Ted Regent. The fire designs are too powerful in their own right and remove the agency and elegance surrounding Days. There's a lot of value in preserving Legacy's claim to be one of the most intricate and skill-testing formats available. Days is an integral part of that equation. The fire designs are not. While this is certainly less true when Days is being used to protect a broken snowball -y threat, on the whole, I view the effect Days has on the metagame to be a positive one especially when the format is being well managed, when Delver is in that sweet spot, or I should say when Tempo is in that sweet spot, Days has a very positive effect on the metagame. It can be easy to forget how wide and powerful the legacy card pool is, and how many cards would absolutely not fly in a format even as powerful as modern. Show and Tell, Ancient Tomb, Reanimating a Gristlebrand, Lion's Eye Diamond, Doomsday. Because the decks that use these cards are good, but rarely ever broken, we become accustomed to them, we become comfortable with them, and we accept them as part of the fabric of the format, and kind of forget about their raw power level. Two and three card combo decks are a dime a dozen. 
most of them aren't competitive enough to see play. You know, and I'm I'm certain there's two and three card combos that I've never even heard of in my time playing. But the ones that do, the best of the best, are designed to win the game on turn one or two, often through a single piece of interaction. It's also rare that the combo deck needs to go all in. Gone are the days when Storm had to cast Infernal Tutor, hold priority, and discard their entire hand to Lion's Eye Diamond. Now you just lead on Veil of Summer, and if it's not countered, you win the game. And if it's forced, you take your 2 for 1 and you move on. Having multiple force effects plus multiple blue cards in the top 8 or 9 cards of your library is a high bar to clear, and it is not uncommon for combo players of any given archetype to feel they have a favorable control matchup, but an unfavorable tempo matchup. This is of course largely due to tempo, having access to pressure, backed up by days. To me, this situation sounds ideal, and this is coming as a control player. We want these sorts of degenerate strategies to be kept in check by the tempo deck, and days is a big part of that. Having to decide to go now and play into days, or wait a turn and potentially give the opponent more time to find answers, with the caveat being that, you know, less of the answers are valid since days doesn't cut it, uh, this is a difficult squeeze for any combo player, and it's one that they are going to mess up some amount of the time, because magic is a game of incomplete information. Zooming out a little, the mere existence of days pushes the metagame into a more fair, more interactive spot, and I think that this is a good thing. The power level of a magic card depends on a lot of things. However, we can still paint a picture of the general power level of days over the course of the game. It's reasonable turn one, though not at its best because returning your first land to your hand is a bigger cost than returning your second land, your third land, etc. It's at its very best on turns two, three, and four, and then after that, it slowly starts falling off. As the game goes on and on, the opponent usually gets to enough mana where they can afford to never play into days for the rest of the game. There's just not a tempo cost because they can do everything they want with their spells. When sitting across from the days player, it can sometimes be hard to know slash appreciate when they've drawn a blank spell on turn 6 because it's hidden information. It's also difficult to know or appreciate that this is why you ended up pulling ahead. But anyone who has played with the card a decent amount can describe to you that painful feeling. Will every game play out like this? No. Sometimes the late game days can still be useful. Sometimes you never reach the late game. However, this still paints a good picture of the general power level of the card and that it has a tangible downside. Compare this to the fire designs. There's no comparison. Ragavan is the best turn 1 threat currently legal in Legacy. While legendary status is a downside, it ends up not being very relevant. The card is a removal magnet, and if your first copy is hitting the opponent multiple times, you're in a favorable position. It doesn't matter that you've drawn an extra one. Its dash ability protects it from sorcery speed removal and makes it a much more relevant late game top deck. The ability to high roll good cards off the opponent's deck gives it the potential to claw back from behind something Days can never do. It's generally correct for the opponent to play around this as well when they are ahead, and so oftentimes the mere existence of Ragavan in a deck gives the controller a free Maze of Ith effect, where the opponent needs to leave one creature behind to block a dash drag again. While it is not always good, on average it remains a relevant card much later into the game than Days will be, whilst having a present chance to steal the game completely by itself. Expressive Iteration has a similarly flat power curve. It provides two cards on turn 3 as often as it does on turn 7, and in fact slightly more often on turn 7, as 2 and 3 mana spells become hits, quote-unquote, for the card. The Tempo Shell receiving card advantage has historically been problematic and led to banning the offender, and this should be no different. Merktad Region hits like a truck. Regardless of when it enters play, 
The opponent has about three turns to answer it, and if they don't, the game ends. This, again, is a much more consistent power level than a card that simply stops working once the opponent has their mana set up. Before I dive into some anti days rebuttals, I'd like to end this section by saying that while looking at the history of Legacy can be useful, we as a community should be mindful of how bizarre the current moment is for this format. In the wake of the February 2021 bans, Delver was in the sweet spot that I outlined in the goals section. It was a strong strategy, but not a must play. In fact, during the February through April trophy split, I ended the season as the trophy leader, playing a deck that revolved around Life in the Loam and Raven's Crime. You might write this off as anecdote, but the more general point that I'm trying to make is that it was possible to beat the Delver decks at the time with overall weaker cards and strategies than it is today. That time was short-lived. Trixhaven was released on April 23rd, and with it, expressive iteration. Modern Horizons 2 followed soon after, on June 18th, and in the span of less than two months, the Delver Shell received expressive iteration, Ragavan, Merktad Regent, and Dragon Rage Channeler, all seeing play as four of us. This point bears repeating. In a seven-week time span, a deck that was Tier 1 upgraded 16 of its 40 non-land slots. This is unheard of. This is insane. This is not sustainable. Can you even imagine the types of cards that a pair of sets would need to have for this to be true of any other archetype in the format? Seriously, I want you, the person listening to this right now, to try and imagine the raw power level it would take for four cards to become staple four ofs in a deck like Red Black Reanimator. Try it for green black depths. Try it for Maverick. What would these cards need to do to realistically see play as four ofs? A noble hierarch that has a chance to draw a card when it taps for mana? What about a two mana knight of the reliquary that flew and got bigger when you played a second one? Maybe the sylvan library effect on a sorcery that didn't cost life. Maybe a Gaddock Teague that scryed when you cast a creature spell. Now imagine that Maverick got all these things in a single set. Would anyone think that Green Sun Zenith was the reason for its meteoric rise? Green Sun Zenith has been great in Maverick for a long time, after all. It's the glue that holds it together, and it even makes the new cards better because it gives Maverick more consistent access to them. Of course we wouldn't think this. We would immediately see the issue for what it was, the threats themselves. If Death and Taxes in a single set got upgrades to Mother of Runes, Thalia, Flickerwisp, and Recruiter of the Guard, would anyone be tempted to pin the blame on Aether Vial? I think we all know the answer. In the previous section, I talked a bit about how days falls off the longer the game goes, and this carries with it an interesting property where the stronger a shell that days is housed in, the stronger days feels, because the game ends quicker. So it's kind of understandable that Days has felt strong recently. It got stronger. But if we take a step back, we can see the underlying cause for this. The unprecedented deluge of pushed cards added to the archetype and added in such a short span of time. This is the problem. Now I'm going to outline some arguments I hear commonly from players who support a Days ban. There's some amalgamation going on here, since the same idea can be worded many ways, but I'm going to steel man the sentiments, giving the best versions of each idea. The flow of this idea is generally as follows. We keep banning the threats, but nothing changes. Delver is always too good. We need to hit something from the shell. Two thoughts come to mind. The first is that the threats of a tempo deck are an intrinsic part of the shell. It wasn't called Blue Red Days, it was called Blue Red Delver. Until, of course, Delver got power crept and it became Blue Red Tempo. In banned conversations of yesteryear, Delver of Secrets was occasionally floated as a ban consideration. It was the best one mana creature the archetype had access to, and so a Delver ban would meaningfully impact the speed at which the deck could apply pressure. It weakens the shell. Weakening the threats weakens the shell. The second and more important thought is 
this and nothing changes, Delver is always too good. This lacks historical accuracy. When looking over four plus years of a format's history, it can be easy to gloss over specific points in time and come to a more general sense of a deck being too good. But actually traversing the timeline reveals many periods where things did change, Delver wasn't too good, just another playable strategy, and that these periods were frequently in the wake of bannings. After the Treasure Cruise and Dig Through Time bans, which was right around when I started playing the format, Miracles was the clear tier 0 deck. Delver was just a playable strategy. Grixis Delver was the best deck during the first half of 2018. It's not debatable. However, in the wake of the Death Rate Shaman and Probe bans, it reverted to being a good but nowhere near tier 0 strategy, where it remained for an entire year until the printing of Renan 6. When Luris was banned, Delver was a good but not tier 0 strategy, facing stiff competition from the pre nerfed companion decks, Ryan and Garuda, with Garuda being the best deck in the format. The February 2021 bans left a window where Delver was again good but not tier 0, though this was admittedly short lived, as discussed in the Unprecedented Times section. The main point here is that when a card is banned from the tempo shell, it actually does move the deck to the desired power level quite frequently. A strong but not tier 0 deck is a healthy deck to exist in the context of Legacy, and this has been the case for many stretches of time. Sometimes, people like to draw a comparison between Days in Legacy and Mishra's Workshop in Vintage. There is kind of an understanding among the Vintage community that Mishra's Workshop would probably be restricted if such a thing were only determined by power level. However, Watsi must consider other factors like community reaction and the implications of restricting a card with such a hefty secondary market price. To compensate, we see a lot of dorky looking 2 and 3 mana artifacts on the vintage restricted list. Because many vintage cards have died quote unquote, for the sins of Workshop, and many cards have been banned from tempo shells, people declare that Days is having its own perverse effect on the legacy ban list. Here's my succinct reasoning for why this comparison doesn't work. The power level of cards banned from the tempo shell are leaps and bounds beyond the artifacts restricted out of shops. Days does not work the way Workshop does. Days takes very strong cards and synergizes well with them. Mishra's Workshop takes cards you wouldn't play unlimited, and makes them broken. Oko is not in the same universe as Transphere. Renin 6 is not similar to Thorn of Amethyst. These cards are not dying for the sins of days, they are dying for their own sins. Another common point I hear frequently is, so what? Are we just going to keep banning cards out of the tempo shell every 6 to 12 months? Forever? And of course, the implication here is that if we would just ban days instead, we wouldn't need to keep banning cards in the future. I think this logic is flawed, and we can illuminate this with a very simple thought experiment. If we were to ban days tomorrow, what cards from the tempo shell do you think would be safe to unban? The answer is almost certainly none of them. Deathrite Shaman was played in basically every deck that could splash green or black and allowed players to wasteland and stifle the opponent without slowing down their own game plan. Dreadhorde Arcanist is still too good, backed up by 8 forces, while nullifying their card disadvantage downside. Renin 6 is a 2 mana card advantage engine that recurs Wasteland and Ices X1s out of the format. Lurus is currently a dominating force in Modern, even after the companion nerf. Elko is still too good and Treasure Crew as well, you know. There's no perfect card that if gone, leads to a balanced and healthy legacy indefinitely. This is simply the nature of a game that adds game pieces every few months, and we want it this way. Things would quickly grow stale if nothing ever changed. The most proximate cause of future bans is not whether or not Days is legal. It's whether or not WotC does their due diligence when designing new cards, and whether or not they shift away from the current marketing strategy of printing broken cards to drive sales banning them a few months later, rinsing and repeating.
I think if you've gotten to this point in the video, you can probably guess my next thoughts. The fire designs are intrinsically too good. While the cheap snowbally threats among them do synergize well with days, banning days would not bring them to an acceptable power level. If you need another piece of evidence for this, look no further than modern. Pre MH2, the blue red tempo shell was an untiered strategy. People tried to make it work, but it was not competitively viable. Currently, what basically amounts to a glorified Modern Horizons 2 block constructed deck with Ragavan, Dragon's Rage Channeler, Murktide Regent, Counterspell, Unholy Heat, and Honorary MH2 card, Expressive Iteration, is a tier 1 strategy in Modern. Lacking days seems to not be a hindrance. So, that's the video. We covered a lot here. For everyone who got this far, thank you. As I think was clear in the video, I am very fond of days. I think it adds a lot of depth to the format by providing a rich strategic subgame when it shows up and feel it pushes the metagame towards fairer, more interactive magic. I think we all want the same thing, healthier legacy format, even if we disagree on how to get there. It's always a lot easier to ban a card than it is to unban one, and for me, the disaster case is a days ban that doesn't fix things, as we would lose the wonder and depth that days brings to the format in a way that would be hard to undo. I talked about why banning days won't bring current fire designs to acceptable power level and would not stop future cards from needing bans. Tempo can exist at a healthy power level in Legacy. It's done so many times before and can do so again. The problem cards are Ragavan, Expressive Iteration, and Merc's Evasion, and I believe banning them would position Tempo at a desirable power level. Thanks for watching.